Hello, everyone. I am Paola Corti, and I am the Open Education Community Manager of the European Network of Open Education Librarians, uh, the Spark Europe community of librarians working to develop and share knowledge about open education. This is the eighth web workshop of the Embrace the Open series, and our topic today is how to start an institutional open education pilot project. Uh, with us, we have uh, Claudia Hackel, Project Manager, Open Education at Austria Advanced Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Vienna in Austria. And we have Mira Baust-Zuck, uh, Academic Information Specialist and Open Education Pillar Leader at University of Groningen Library in the Netherlands. And we have Marta Bustillo, Digital Learning Librarian, Digital Literacy Lead and OER Advocate, Information and Learning Services Team at the University College Dublin Library in Ireland. Welcome, and I'm very happy to have you three as our facilitators today. It's going to be interesting, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for the intro, Paula. Um, yeah, let's start with the uh, learning objectives. What will you hopefully have at the end of uh, this workshop today. Uh, so as facilitators, uh, we hope that you have started to understand the importance of OER in the context of your uh, institution, in terms of institutionally anchoring OER, maybe infrastructure development, service development, whatever your focus is here. Then um, we hope that you have identified um, diverse uh, requirements or perspectives on OER and um, different roles as well, such as users, producers, and so on. We also hope that you have generated ideas on the development of how you can start or how you can further develop your infrastructure and services for OER in order to support um, your um, university. And um, with that, um, we see the workshop program up uh, on the screen. And uh, we will start uh, with an uh, um, we're having a look at the framework um, of open education policy um, and everything that in, uh, influences open educational practices at uh, universities or high, higher education institutions. Then we will dive into three um, national perspectives, uh, University of Groningen, University of Vienna and University College Dublin. And afterwards, we'll spread out and see what stakeholders um, could you include in your starting um, a pilot uh, OER project at your institution. And at the end, we'll have some possible next steps for you ready. And then we will dive into the discussion. Thank you. So maybe let's start first with um, identifying the framework. Um, what <clears throat> should you take in mind or what should you consider when starting an OER project? Um, so. First of all, um, we will start with the global perspective, then dive into the uh, European higher education sector. Then we'll go into the national perspectives, the three I told you already, and then uh, we'll have a look at your own institution. So let's start the journey with the global perspective and uh, let's see uh, what pops up there first. So we have, of course, the sustainable development goal um, uh, here in focus is uh, number four, the quality education where um, it's uh, crucial to ensure inclusive and equitable um, quality education and promote lifelong learning, which um, of course OER and um, for example, massive open online courses or all other uh, freely available um, learning resources are part of. And uh, so we have this um, framework to consider when we start an OER uh, institutional pilot project. Then we'll see on the uh, next slide um, a bit further into this um, SDG number four. Um, OER can promote and reinforce the knowledge sharing and the collaboration between the stakeholders. For example, between um, the teaching faculty of your institution, they can increase the access to learning. Also, for example, if you want to um, reach out to um, um, students in school that want to start studying at university, they can also have a quick look into um, uh, what it's like to study at a university, for example, but also from other um, uh, higher education contexts, um, you can uh, open up the access to learning. Um, you can also, um, OER also um, are actively used 
um, in all sectors of education, and they can be an uh, instrument to improve the quality uh, in terms of making it visible, making it transparent, and of course the digital and yeah, uh, World Economic uh, is also digital, so um, we're all uh, all about the digital um, open educational resources. So let's see next up. Um, we have the UNESCO OER recommendation that I also take in mind um, when starting an institutional OER project um, at your university, higher education institution. Um, so we have only one existing um, international standard setting instrument on OER. Um, you see the five action areas on this slide. So um, we have the um, uh, action, area of, uh, action area of building capacity of stakeholders to create the access to also reuse uh, OER, also adapt and redistribute OER, but also developing the supportive policies. You will see um, in the national examples um, a few um, uh, examples on how this policy and how the supportive policy can um, yeah, take in mind um, and um, is, is available at different institutions. Then afterwards, we'll have the encouraging effect um, of the inclusivity and the um, uh, also the access to quality OER. So we have some similarities there um, uh, in terms of the SDG and the UNESCO OER recommendation. We also have the cre creation of sustain sustainability models for OER in terms of not um, not always recreating uh, creating new material, but recreating, reusing, readapting. And then of course, um, through open educational resources, we can promote and reinforce the international cooperation and um, make um, teaching activities visible through um, over the borders of our own uh, institution. So that's also one um, policy, um, one framework to take in mind. And let's have a look at the next one. We also have the teaching and learning for the future in terms of sustainability. Um, we have the U UN uh, 2030 agenda um, that promotes the uh, sustainability factor of um, teaching and learning. Also lifelong learning comes in there. So you see a lot of similarities and um, a similar vibe coming from these frameworks. Yeah. And um, yeah, let's, let's have a look. Um, on the next slide, we have um, a different approach. It's it's coming from the science sector, not um, only from the teaching sector, but also from the science uh, perspective. We have policy and framework on OER in the EU's open science policy. Um, so this is not a global perspective anymore. It's um, covering um, uh, the EU's uh, perspective. We have a um, uh, few ambitions on um, uh, open science. And in the open science policy, we have the educational skills. And you'll see on the next slide um, that these educational skills are necessary and, um, in, um, in order to um, apply open science research routines and practices when you are a scientist in Europe at an higher education institution, wherever you're situated. So open science practices are the umbrella term for a few different uh, few different practices. And let's have a look. Um, uh, yeah, what broad practices are um, combined here? We have um, the open access um, competence, for example, open data, but also open education, open peer review and citizen science. So um, this is, uh, to take in mind that from the science, uh, open science perspective, uh, open education, open data, open data, uh, open access, and open science are always thought together. And um, yeah, that's why we're also here um, because we're um, um, yeah people that work in the in the library sector, but we also support um, open science practices. We we support scientists. We support teaching faculty. We can work together. Um, with the teaching center, you see a few examples um, in the national perspectives uh, following up on how you can work together to achieve um, these kind of um, uh, yeah, this kind of goals. So let's see on the next slide. We'll we'll start in our um, yeah first dive in the national perspective. We wanted to ask you first on how um, yeah uh, where um, you're situated. Um, so I'll just quickly share my screen um, to get a quick look at 
where we're all from. So let's see, you'll see in the chat um, a link to the uh, Google Forms and please enter and feel free to answer. Uh, the answers are anonymous and we'll see where our group today is from. So in which country is your institution situated? Let's have a look and see. We have the first one uh, coming uh, from Italy. Um, and we have Austria here. So we have a few questions for you. You see that now. Um, but maybe let's stick to this few there. Um, yeah, maybe maybe let's uh, wait for you all to finish uh, the, the questions so we can uh, move on with, um, uh, with our slides and always um, keep track of what you answered. So let's wait a few minutes uh, and please answer all of the um, uh, questions. We have only a few there for you, simple, short questions to get a quick overview. So I see a few answers are coming in. So um, while we um, have the questions up, maybe let's um, move to the slides again and um, have a look at the first national perspective that we're bringing your way today. Yes, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Marta, for sharing. Uh, so welcome to the Netherlands. In this case, uh, we'll talk about the OER uh, ecosystem in the Netherlands, but particularly uh, at the University of Groningen, what we're doing in terms of open education services here. Thank you. So first is the national context. Very briefly, what's happening in the Netherlands? A lot is happening. Uh, there is ambition and there is focus. Open is supposed to be the norm by, uh, well, first of all, we uh, thought it would be the norm by 2025. Uh, this was uh, so established, so mentioned in um, uh, several governmental documents and strategies, ambition plans uh, 10 years ago and a few years ago. Uh, but things are changing. We also are adjusting to reality, to uh, how things are going. Now the ambition and the focus is to have open as the norm uh, by 2032. Um, the national programs now are um, opting for an optimal mix of educational resources um, that would be available uh, to anyone in the Dutch higher education from a single national digital ecosystem, accessible to everyone at any time, but also anywhere. Uh, there is also a big focus on digital open educational resources. Um, the statement is that they should be naturally open and fair. Um, but in this mix, we also talk about semi-open and purchased educational resources, if that uh, helps uh, educational goals of the institution of the, um, of the study and of the learner. There's also an, quite an active national infrastructure being developed. Uh, we have EduSources, that's the repository and search portal where all participating institutions uh, can both upload their open materials or semi-open materials and search through them. Uh, there's also a large knowledge bank developed and roadmaps, ro roadmaps. Most of them have been translated into English, so I invite you to explore them further. There will be links uh, shared in the slides as well, so you will have a chance to go and take a look. And uh, there's also a large community, community of enablers uh, around edu sources as well. So people like us, uh, well, enthusiasts and advocates of uh, open education, building services at our institutions, but also a community of practitioners, professional communities of people, um, well, uh, creating open educational resources and engaging with open practices all around. The range covers the whole um, higher and vocational education in the Netherlands. So that's universities, University of Applied Sciences and vocational uh, schools or vocational institutions. I'm sure in many countries you have a similar division. So in this case, we cover all of them. And uh, let's uh, say a few words about the national framework. There is a national approach to digital and open educational resources that was signed uh, two years ago by all the associations of universities and universities of applied sciences and by SURF. SURF is uh, the digital cooperation of uh, Dutch higher education institutions. Um, it's a, a sort of um, non-profit organization. It's a collaboration uh, aiming to um, well, uh, aiming to better make better use of the 
uh, digitization and uh, for the benefit of Dutch higher education. So this is basically a cooperation of all higher uh, educational institutions. And uh, together with the growth fund financing, um, they launched the NPULS program last year that is now also administering small grants, small finances, impulse finances for the institutions willing to um, build up further build up their open educational services. There's also open science um, infrastructure in the country uh, represented by Open Science NL, uh, which in many cases also has a lot of points of uh, intersection with the open educational infrastructure and the system of governance. And there are several national working groups and collaborations networks of the uh, Dutch Royal Library, um, you see one of them is BOO, that's the collaboration of open and uh, online um, educational resources of the libraries, and also Dutch University Presses collaboration. So that's in a nutshell, the national framework for the Netherlands. Now, uh, when it comes to the context in the University of Groningen, um, I'd like to, uh, to start with addressing uh, this OER adoption pyramid. Of course, we haven't started uh, by addressing all the levels of it. We focused on several elements to begin with, uh, starting with infrastructure and building some system, building uh, something. But then um, by this time, we are trying to address all the levels of it. Next slide. So where are we at at the moment? Uh, to answer this question, I will use this uh, nice infographics developed by our partners at SURF. You will also have a chance to dive deeper into it in one of our interaction moments, but I will uh, just take you uh, step for step, uh, level by level, as uh, my university is making this journey. So we'll, step, uh, we'll start with the following slide, which is level one, exploration through a pilot. Um, how it all started. It started five years ago, exactly five years ago in 2019, uh, with the several pilots that we started together with um, the collaboration of SURF and EduSources. So first of all, we uh, participated as one of the pilot institutions with setting up the national repository, ShareKit and search engine EduSources uh, to try and implement it at our institution to try and see uh, how our early adopters would be using it and what kind of support would be needed to maintain it. We started also with another pilot. Uh, we developed a workshop for teachers on redesigning courses with open educational resources. Based on that, together again with our partners from SURF, we developed a roadmap that would help other institutions develop similar workshops and integrate them, implement them as uh, their own in their institutions, adopting, adapting them to their own needs. And we also embarked on a pilot of the open uh, textbook publishing within our university. We have a university publisher, University of Groningen Press. Uh, so we're trying to build on their available expertise and experience uh, with working with open access monographs, open access journals. Uh, we were trying to look and see if we can uh, launch the same kind of initiative for open textbooks. Uh, to begin with, we were using the top-down approach in this case. Um, we uh, sort of were guided by the idea that we will build it and they will come. Uh, so trying to first build the infrastructure, set up the system, uh, set up the uh, well, something attractive to the early adopters and targeting them. Uh, also. Uh, aiming at providing interventions uh, to raise awareness about the promise of open education, the added value of open educational resources, and of course, exploring the institutional horizons and stakeholders. So everything you basically do when you set up a pilot at any institution. But most importantly, what we were doing during this period and still continue doing, but I think this was the cornerstone, was building relationships. We invested a lot of time and effort into building relationships, first of all, with our target audience, with the teachers, the early adopters to begin with, but also with other stakeholders, with other support services all across the university. Um, and this was uh, the first pilot few years to begin with. Now the next level. Yeah, thank you. The next level is where we're at right now, development of a service. Uh, still ongoing, we started with uh, developing and uh, well, setting up a working service, sustainable working service 
uh, several years ago under the framework of the Open Science Program. It's um, a university-wide open science program. As you see, it contains several pillars of which open education is one of this uh, pillar under this umbrella. So the first edition of the program finished last year and the new one is about to begin this year. Uh, we will continue building these services further and I will tell you a bit later what these services actually entail at our university. Now, the next level is where we're not at at the moment. Hopefully for in the future, our ambition would be to get there, to maximize open educational resources at our institution, uh, to have open education and open uh, licenses as the preferred choice for publication for all educational materials of our, at our institution, and uh, to ensure that our university is one of the leading uh, national universities uh, in terms of open education. So that is the ambition for uh, just a few years from now, hopefully after the end of the current open science program. Next one. So you can see here in a, in a glance, at a glance, um, what we've done, where we're at, we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, we've done a lot, but also there's still so much ground to cover. Uh, and I find it quite exciting and something really to look forward to. Next one. Now, what does support service um, consist of in our context? First of all, uh, there's the university library. Uh, that's the hub of uh, the knowledge and services on, open, on and around open education. And um, I've also indicated very indicatively the FTEs, the full-time equivalent of uh, personnel that we have available dedicated to that. Of course, many more people are involved in one or another capacity, but some are actually dedicated purely to um, supporting and maintaining and establishing open education services. We also have University of Groningen Press, that's our uh, publisher, university publisher, uh, located at the library, associated with the library, but we also closely collaborate with the uh, the colleagues, didactic uh, teacher trainer colleagues from the Education Support and Innovation. They belong to the Center for uh, Information Technology. In your university, they might be located in the Center for Teaching and Learning or any other configuration, but these are our close colleagues and friends uh, who deal with the didactics, the, uh, well, the educationalists of our team of RMIX. We also closely work with the university services, the policy office of our university, and also have someone dedicated there uh, to be available for the open education needs. Thanks. But there's also so much more happening and so many more connections, uh, some with dotted lines, some with very solid connections. We have the university-wide open science program, which I've mentioned. We also have the open science community, Groningen, uh, also an important part for developing all things open. Uh, we have the Digital Competence Center that deals with fair and open uh, data and software, uh, research data man management, and all the other concepts within their field of expertise. We have the communities of practice within the Teaching Academy, Groningen. And we've also established a network of faculty open education contact persons across uh, 11 faculties that we have at our university. Next one. So very briefly, I'll tell you about uh, what the open education uh, services at our university actually entail. We provide um, a lot of information. We collect it, we, uh, we curate it, uh, we provide guidelines and working with OER and open practices. Uh, my colleague Martijn has collected this extensive curated OER uh, library of OER sources. Um, also lots of inspirational examples that we collect from our own teachers at the UG, uh, but also across the Netherlands and internationally. Whenever our teachers are wondering how they can apply this or other um, open uh, practice, we would send them to this bank of ideas. And we also highlight the available support channels. We do this mostly centering around the university library, uh, but this information has also been in, in, in incorporated into the UTQ, the University Teaching Qualifications, uh, into our Center for Teaching and Learning webpage, faculty web pages in their LMS, and also upcoming Central Education Portal toolbox. Next one. We also do workshops and information sessions together with our colleagues at Education Support and Innovation. We uh, provide teacher training based on the UNESCO competency framework as our guidance. I've also linked it here in the slides, so later you can also explore it if you're wondering where to start or what skills to address first. We provide webinars and on-site events or uh, trainings. 
workshops, uh, very general ones on OER, but also topic specifics. If we want to address, for instance, open pedagogy, we also developed a micro lab format, a sort of guided mini course. A part of it you do asynchronously uh, online, and then a part of it you um, also do um, synchronously in person uh, training uh, for course redesign. We also uh, conduct presentations and small short trainings at staff meetings and trainings, embedded open, embedding open education as connected practice. And uh, as I've mentioned, it's also embedded in the university teaching qualifications as a permanent section there. Next one. And uh, something we're really proud of is the Open Textbook Publishing Initiative. Well, now I can call it a service uh, that's based at the University of Groningen Press, UGP. Um, it's a new university press, a so-called new university press, NOOP, uh, and a diamond open accent pu publisher. Um, we are now developing a broader open textbook portfolio here with the UGP. So um, we have created some interactive web books together, of course, with our wonderful teacher authors, but also more traditional um, e-textbooks, traditional PDF formats, uh, but also student created web books. We recently published um, fully student created um, online textbook. Uh, under an open license. The goal here is to reach an optimal mix between more traditional types of forms of uh, open textbook and more innovative projects, and to be able to respond to the very innovative needs our authors come with, um, to integrate them properly into education. So we do this mostly uh, based at the university library, at the University of Groningen uh, Press, but also we involve other services on demand, for instance, our didactic colleagues from the uh, education support and innovation. And for the press, uh, for the infrastructure, we use press books mostly, but also open monograph press. And we provide consultations, um, both on demand initiated by our teachers who come to us uh, through central channels because they find us or they've heard our presentation and heard what's possible, uh, but also they get forwarded to us via the faculty contacts I've mentioned. The range of topics is quite large, starting from searching for OER uh, to replace some course literature, to sharing OER, to co-creating with students, open pedagogy, integrating it into course design, you name it. We've also partnered with our colleagues from grant support services because nowadays many uh, both research and educational grants, uh, public grants come with the requirement of having uh, output shared as uh, under an open license as an OER. So we can also jump in and start consulting at the, at the stage of grant application process, for instance, uh, to provide them with better information. Uh, we also implement it together with our colleagues from all across the university and we involve uh, the help of any other support point we find necessary at this uh, point and use lots of different infrastructure channels some of it um, very actively, some of it uh, occasionally, and uh, because we haven't found a better alternative yet, for instance, uh, YouTube. Next one. We do a lot of um, outreach and events too, to increase awareness and adoption of open education at the University of Groningen. I've mentioned the faculty contact points. We also do faculty tours. Uh, so we try to jump in into any kind of uh, faculty staff meeting or lab meeting. Um, usually they're very eager to have some interesting innovative topics uh, to be presented there and to discuss. Um, so we are always ready to jump in and go and, and talk to the faculties in this case. Um, we also disseminate information through our dedicated open science channels and library channels. They're quite active on social media and utilize uh, teachers and other support groups, communities of practice uh, to reinforce open as the norm. Uh, try to also uh, will display our teachers open educational excellence at the national events, but also international ones. You see here a picture from our presentation as, at uh, last year's OE Global, for instance, but also do lots of uh, other information initiatives such as uh, podcasts. You see Open Science Bites here. The first season was on open education, uh, also open science blog where we highlight some interesting open education cases uh, that would be attractive to uh, our teachers and researchers. Next one. And we have a lot of collaborations, national, international, within the university, but also with some other uh, interesting um, stakeholders, including this group, including the NOL and Spark Europe. Um, and we implement it mostly by the university library in this case. Next one. 
The next big things, what's next for us in the pipeline? We'll continue with um, building this or uh, maintaining this uh, service and making it more and more sustainable, but also implementing it and improving it within the next edition of the Open Science Program. Uh, the next big challenge is to incentivize OER adoption by uh, well, um, actually finally getting an institutional OER policy. We don't have it yet, despite all the other activities we've managed to implement, we're still acting without the policy. We do have a very permissive institutional environment allowing us to do all this, which is already really good. And we hope to explore uh, rewards and recognition with se several faculties uh, with the educational tracks uh, and uh, increase the visibility and track the outputs of open education by our teachers. So what we're already doing and what we will continue doing is to position open education as the norm. We're not questioning whether it should be the norm. We're accepting it as the natural norm already and further embedding it into other support services, not always under the spotlight, but as a tool to actually achieve other very pragmatic goals uh, that our teachers have in this uh, day and age. For that, we need to diver diversify our support capacity, the range of it, um, to address all the comp complex innovative ideas our teachers come with. Um, and we are also very much interested in leveraging our open education um, excellence of our teachers for uh, achieving sustainable development goals and for international collaboration. So in a nutshell, this was the open education service at our university and the, the timeline of how we achieved it. Next one. And you'll hear now a very interesting story uh, of a very different type from uh, Claudia about OER in Austria and the University of Vienna. Thank you very much. So yeah, let's travel to the next country, Austria, and uh, I will bring to you the example of University of Vienna. So following up the framework in the beginning, um, I will um, I have here for you the Open Science uh, Policy Austria, and you see many, many similarities in, in, um, in this policy to the EU Open Science Policy. So we have here the umbrella term uh, Open Science Practices, um, which includes uh, open access, open research, and also um, open education. Um, but also open infrastructure, open methods, and so on. So we have a similar fame, uh, framework nationally um, for these uh, open science practices. And um, so let's see on the um, next slide. We have um, uh, another paragraph covering the uh, opening, the importance of opening the learning uh, resources. So we have the COVID pandemic in here as well, because this was one of the main drivers in the last years um, for uh, Austrian higher education sector to start um, and to further develop uh, OER services. Um, and that's why it's also in here in this uh, policy, because the OERs are um, uh, yeah, the way to share also uh, knowledge that is um, provided and um, is found in university sector. And we also have here uh, the eight ambitions, uh, similar to the open science policy from the EU. Um, we have the skills and education um, uh, abstract here as well. And we'll have a quick look um, in the next slide on what this actually means. So you see more similarities here. Uh, all researchers in uh, Europe Oh, in Austria, sorry for that uh, mini typo. Uh, so they have the simil uh, similar expression here. Um, uh, they um, uh, tell researchers um, in order to apply open science uh, practices, they uh, need the appropriate uh, services and, and so on. And these, um, yeah, on the next slide, um, the, um, yeah, we have the services here. Um, on one side, we have one big uh, national OER project. Um, that is covering the whole of the Austrian higher education sector. It's Open Education Austria, Open Education Austria Advanced, um, where I also come from. Uh, we are a project of several Austrian universities together, funded by the Ministry of um, 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 of Education in Austria, and we're joint uh, joint development of solu different solutions for o OER in the Austrian higher education sector. And uh, our team is a cooperation of e-learning centers, um, such as um, Mira also mentioned. Um, we have uh, university libraries on board, but also we have the central IT services. And um, yeah, with that, we try to contribute uh, best uh, to um, establish open practices 
analogous to um, the open access, open data initi initiatives as well. And uh, this also started in 2016 as the first project. And now we have the follow-up project, um, which will uh, end at the end of the year. And then, um, yeah, let's see what uh, will come next. Uh, so let's have a look on the next slide, the project objectives. Uh, I put one of the main uh, objectives uh, first, which is the OER hub. We have the OS, um, national search engine for OER from the higher education sector, where several Austrian universities are already connected to. And um, um, the plan is, and also what we have to do is to connect further um, uh, universities and support them in um, local technical development of, um, of repositories, for example, but also um, we established uh, a national OER certification body where you can certify your institution as an OER higher education institution, but you can also certify yourself if you're a teaching uh, staff, for example, as an OER practitioner. So we have this certification uh, level um, in Austria as well, and it's a national OER certification body. We have um, further training offers. Oh, one slide back, please. Thank you. Uh, wasn't finished yet. Um, so we have further training offers on OER, um, which um, were open to uh, the whole of the Austrian higher education sector. And um, uh, combining with the national OER certifi certification body, um, we uh, published um, training concepts for um, OER training, and um, we um, yeah, enabled, empowered the um, higher education institutions to start their own uh, training, um, yeah, um, um, focused and specified to their institutional needs. We also have um, OER uh, development, of course, uh, which um, uh, I will come to in a second what we do at the uh, University of Vienna, but um, furthermore, uh, we also developed a meta uh, workflow for um, uh, an OER production service at your institution, for example. So if you want to start an OER production service, um, for example, uh, with a, um, a combined with a video studio or podcast studio, for example, um, uh, we got you covered, hopefully. And um, we also have the knowledge transfer in this project. So um, uh, yeah, we have to reach out um, to other um, Austrian higher education institutions and we also have the consultation factor in here. So if, um, yeah, another Austrian university, for example, wants to start, um, make first steps in OER, um, we are, um, yeah, the ones where they go to. Let's have a look uh, at the OER hub um, slide. Thank you. So this is our meta search engine for uh, OER from the whole of the Austrian higher education sector. The plan is um, to make further um, local repositories uh, searchable. So we have um, a few universities connected already. Um, and um, if you search in the OER hub, you will be linked directly to the resources in the institutional repository. So all the data owner, uh, data ownership uh, is covered and uh, universities still own their data. It's only the uh, metadata that flows in between here. Yeah, so let's have a look at another um, OER um, service in Austria. I have here for you on the next slide iMOOCs. Uh, it's a national MOOC platform. It has, um, uh, I looked it up today because it changes uh, all the time. New MOOCs are popping up. Uh, it has about 160 MOOCs available to the public. So it's not only for the higher education sector, but it's available for the public. But uh, higher education institutions in Austria can contribute MOOCs to this platform. It's run by the Technik University of Graz. And um, yeah, uh, several universities have contributed there already. For example, um, us at University of Vienna, we have already um, contributed uh, 21 MOOCs on several different topics, uh, digitalization, climate change, um, um, any any um, any topics really. Um, so if you wanna uh, have a look, it's uh, available for learners from age uh, six years to lifelong learning, so open to the public. And um, yeah, that's that's also another national OER service available in the higher education sector, but uh, yeah, even further. And on the next slide, 
we jump into uh, University of Vienna. So the institutional framework um, is here for you. So we have the open access policy and open access office uh, available to our um, university staff um, uh, since 2013, 2014. So um, yeah, about 10 years now. Uh, research data management policy followed um, a few years ago. And we also have a research data management task force um, which um, is um, situated at different um, university uh, sectors. For example, their um, colleagues from the library, their colleagues from the IT services. Um, but um, I'm also in there for the teaching uh, factor, um, their colleagues from doctoral schools and so on. So we have um, several uh, people combined in this task force um, yeah, to keep the open science practices at University of Vienna on track. And now let's have a look in the open education um, uh, factor at University of Vienna. So um, you see OER in the center of these uh, three, um, uh, three um, um, yeah, centers basically at University of Vienna. We have um, Center for Teaching and Learning where I'm from now. Um, and uh, we contribute um, OER and collaborate with the central IT service, but also with the university library. And um, yeah, let's see what follows next. Um, we'll have a first look at the um, CTL. What do we offer and what do we have at the CTL um, covering open educational resources? Of course, we have qualification offers. We also have the learning uh, management system Moodle, which offers um, quite a few um, possibilities to produce or use uh, OER in the long term. Um, I will give a quick outlook afterwards as well. Um, on what we're working at the moment. We have a um, big MOOC production team uh, where um, teaching faculty can come to us um, and start a project of a massive open online course. Um, uh, we also have media didactic advice. And uh, yeah, we have this media production service and the CTL video studio where, uh, where you can, um, as a teacher at University of Vienna, you can um, come up with an idea of uh, your own personal OER that you can use in your um, a lecture, for example, and um, get it produced, uh, published as well, and um, yeah, combined with media didactic advice. And let's have a look at the uh, central IT services, what the colleagues over there have covering OER. So you see also trainings and instructions. Then they have uh, all the they host all the uh, technical infrastructure. They further develop um, uh, IT support for research as well, where open science is the main topic. And as you see, uh, open science also covers uh, open education um, in the in the mind of University of Vienna. Um, we have the um, uh, main repository, uh, Phaedra, uh, where we publish our open educational resources. And uh, we also have the qualification offers, which um, are offered combined with the central IT services and the university library. Also the um, FEDRA repository is a combined project of both parties here. And at the end, we have uh, last but not least, the university library. Um, they have all the open science support, of course. Uh, they have uh, different webinar series and trainings as well. They have um, all the infrastructure for the research data management I told you about already. And also uh, the publication of OER in FEDRA is a main part here with all the metadata, um, uh, metadata schemes and so on. Um, yeah, so that's that's a look at uh, the, the diverse perspective on OER uh, coming from these three collaborating parties at University of Vienna. Thank you. Let's have a look at the next slide. Uh, yeah, so I have the next steps for you. We're working on the OER policy at the moment. Um, we're working on a um, um, connection between the learning platform uh, Moodle and the meta search engine uh, to make the OER even more uh, easily available to teaching faculty. And we can hopefully share uh, this plugin that we're working on um, with the whole Moodle community afterwards. Uh, I told you about the certification, um, the Austrian National uh, OER certification. We're currently working on the, um, yeah, certify the institutional OER training offer at our university and to start it and yeah, uh, offer teaching faculty to get themselves uh, certified as an OER practitioner. 
And uh, yeah, of course, we would love for University of Vienna to be a certified OER at edu higher education institution soon. Thank you. And let's travel to the next country. So le let me introduce you. Oh, let's go back a little bit first um, to what's happening in um, Ireland at University College Dublin. Um, I have to say from the very beginning that we are not anywhere near as advanced as either the Netherlands or Austria. We are still very first steps. So there are two organizations in Ireland that look after open science and open education. One is uh, the National Open Research Forum, which is the organization that um, looks after developing um, kind of rolling out the open science policies that are uh, coming from Europe. Um, it was first established in 2017 and um, in 2022, they published a national action plan for open research. In Ireland, open research is, is more probably translated as open science rather than just focusing on research. Um, so this is their national action plan for open research and they have a specific action to strengthen links between open research and related agendas and activities, including research culture, research integrity, but also open education and public engagement with research. So it is acknowledged in the National Action Plan that there is a link between open research and open education. And then we have another organization, which is the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning. And they provide funding for projects that further the educational agenda in, in Ireland. Uh, so projects that support in, innovative approaches to education. And they are the leader in the area of open education. They support open education principles and all of the funding um, is, you. if you receive funding from the National Forum, all of the outputs of that funding have to be open educational resources. And they have a really good introduction to OERs and open educational practices. And they also have a fabulous um, guide to developing enabling policies for digital and open teaching and learning and a repository where all of the resources that are created with National Forum funding um, can be uploaded or at least linked to. It's not an, uh, an, a search engine. It doesn't harvest from ind individual institutional repositories, but it does gather stuff in its repository. However, there is still no national policy to support open education. There's certainly no certification for either institutions or individuals. And although there are these requirements from the National Forum and this intention from the National Open Research Forum to train educators and researchers in everything that will help them further that open research uh, policy or sort of agenda, there is no actual training support for educators so that they become familiar with open educational practices at the national level. And in terms of where we are at uh, University College Dublin, well, we certainly don't have an institutional open education policy yet or any kind of open education service. However, we are at the beginning of our next strategic planning cycle 
So our previous university strategy covered until 2024, and we are now moving into the next planning cycle. So this is an ideal opportunity for us to introduce the concept of open education and the idea that we need to start thinking about policies and training for educators. Um, we are exploring in the library, we are exploring collaborations with potential stakeholders. And I know, Cla Claudia, you're going to be looking at stakeholders later. So we are speaking to the teaching and learning unit, for instance, to develop an enabling policy for open education. And obviously, we are also collaborating with international organizations such as the ENOL, which is helping us acquire expertise and explore the practical approaches, the, the kind of you know, the, the low hanging fruit, the things that we can do easily and start on our journey to policy development and pilot open education initiatives. And in the meantime, um, I am the, the person in charge of the digital literacy uh, initiative at University College Dublin Library. And one of the things that we have committed to as one of our pillars of the digital literacy framework is that anything that we produce regarding digital literacy, um, so tutorials or courses or anything, that we will try and make them as open as it is within our gift to make them at the moment. Um, and that we post everything that we have on this page that um, there will be links shared for later and that anyone can download whatever they need. Now, I have to own up to the fact that some of the resources that we have created are not, strictly speaking, completely OER, but they are on the journey there. And that's exactly what's happening in Ireland. Thank you, Mira and Marta. Um, and now you had um, yeah, a quick journey uh, through Netherlands, Austria and uh, Ireland and uh, where we're all at at the moment with OER at our um, yeah, individual institutions. Um, now we want to move further um, into your perspective. So let's have a quick look at stakeholders and perspectives that um, yeah, are involved in the OER ecosystem and uh, then we can um, move on to the possible next steps for you uh, when you want to start your institutional pilot um, project or open educational practice at your institution. So let's have a look um, at the stakeholders and the different perspectives. Um, so first we, um, yeah, we asked you um, what your role is um, uh, and, yeah, in the context of OER. And I'll just quickly summarize. We have a um, few colleagues here um, that are uh, librarians, so at the university library, but also OER advocate, um, but also technical advisor. Um, and also at the, um, uh, as I see here, educator, but also creator of OER. So we have a um, really diverse set of uh, OER um, uh, roles in the OER context. And uh, that's where I will follow up uh, in the next slides. Um, so let's start with the first um, uh, stakeholder, first perspective. We have OER from the didactical point of view, where we have the e-learning centers. Um, they, um, yeah, they aim for a sustainable anchoring of OER in uh, mainstream education at the university. And um, yeah, um, Mira, you said that, um, yeah, you say, okay, um, OER is the norm, for example. So um, yeah, that's what the <clears throat> didactical point of view also uh, aims for, uh, also for the further use and didactic development for um, of these free educational resources. Um, content production should be low threshold. Um, um, yeah, they want to raise awareness for OER um, among teachers through the internal university training programs, for example, in the didactic context. They want to create uh, access to the produced OER. So not only produce OER, but also publish them, make them accessible in, for example, repositories, search engines, whatever. Um, uh, and also, um, yeah, they need some kind of institutional OER policy to guide their way um, and to support their work. 
And the next point of view is um, the um, technical point of view. So we have, uh, for example, central IT services at your institution, which um, are covering the storage and the archiving of the data. So the data here is uh, open educational resources. They also want to establish uh, appropriate infrastructure. Um, uh, so um, mostly for research and uh, teaching repositories. So um, yeah, you have to decide if you want to have like uh, one repository for uh, both um, contexts um, or each um, uh, yeah for research one repository and then also one for the OER context. There, there are several ways to do this uh, out there. Um, yeah, so we have this centralized uh, search uh, for OER in the higher education space across the individual systems with the different options, filters, and anything. Uh, which, uh, for example, we also cover in the in the project I told you about uh, to make them uh, the OER accessible. Yeah, then the next question is, um, is the suitable software um, that is OER uh, repository fit? Um, uh, so in um, coming up with a, a decision for a software or um, a solution for your OER repository, um, it's also covering this question. Can it uh, archive OER correctly with the um, specific metadata scheme, for example? Also, the integration is into the institutional system uh, landscape is important for this technical point of view user friendliness, open source, open data in, um, yeah, in, uh, in the context of open education as well. So you see, we have another point of view with many, many uh, aims here, but it doesn't end yet. Um, we'll go on to the next um, point of view. So we have a labra librarian point of view, for example, university libraries. Um, examples could be ensuring the long-term uh, archiving of OER is one aim of uh, colleagues at the university libraries. Um, they uh, need appropriate data formats um, for OER standards. Uh, I, I said already um, uh, the metadata schemes, for example, the learning object metadata um, scheme. Uh, we have controlled vocabularies that have to be considered in, in the context of archiving OER. Also linking the services for research and training and um, yeah, open access um, in the context of open education um, is another point of view to take in mind or maybe to start at when you want to start your institutional OER pilot project. We're not done yet. Um, I promised you a few more um, perspectives. So we have the end user point of view here as well. Um, teaching faculty is a main stakeholder in the OER ecosystem. They need this uh, low threshold uh, content production. They need access to the OER already produced and out there. Um, they uh, want to uh, further develop um, the educational uh, resources out there, for example, um, need internal university training programs. We have the media didactic consultations that um, is important for teaching faculty um, at the institutions. Uh, it would also be good to have some kind of um, legal questions, maybe services or FAQs for legal questions if, if they pop up and they will pop up. Um, and also institutional policies on OER, they give background and the framework for them to work in. So yeah, this is the end user point of view. And the last um, stakeholder perspective I'm bringing to you is uh, more on the institutional meta level. It's coming from the university management. So um, they, yeah, they're looking at strategies. Um, they want to demonstrate the contrib uh, contribution of OER to achieving their university's goals. Um, then you heard a few examples um, in the national uh, perspectives and uh, institutional perspective perspectives beforehand. Yeah, an OER service on an institutional level would uh, break down organizational barriers and they can promote also this collaboration in, in these different departments. Um, I showed you, for example, in uh, e-learning centers, central IT services and university libraries, but also um, furthermore, um, uh, as Mira showed in her example, um, yeah, they want to address the staff in their role as researchers and teaching faculty. So we have these different roles of university staff. Um, they want to encourage OER and uh, also um, think about uh, pro provide incentives on how teaching faculty um, yeah, can be um, um, motivated um, 
to start um, doing open educational um, uh, practices and how, and how to start there. They want to integrate um, OER in, of different uh, granularity into teaching. So coming from a really short, um, uh, really short um, uh, paragraph or an infographic or some kind of short um, podcast um, going up to a massive open online course that can be included in a, in a, a teaching setting. And of course, uh, they're responsible for open educational um, policies and uh, therefore the um, uh, infrastructure coming um, from uh, top to bottom. So these are a few perspectives to take in mind. But um, yeah, I'm sure there are a few more out there or many, many more out there. So let's have a look on the next slide um, on yeah the different perspectives. Um, next slide will show you all of these in action here. We have the different roles. Also, um, you provided in your answers in the questionnaire what um, yeah what uh, roles do you uh, cover in the OER context? So we had many of these um, also covered by you now here in this uh, workshop room. We also have policy makers, infrastructure managers, and so on. Um, but what else would you add? So what perspective of OER um, would you add here in this ecosystem that we couldn't cover uh, in this uh, short time? So maybe um, some kind of new experimental pedagogy, um, one of you answered. Um, also um, the technical perspective, which is uh, already covered in there. Um, and also the learner's perspective. So this would be a nice adoption here. Um, uh, one of you um, said that you would add the learner's perspective uh, into, um, yeah, to take in mind when starting an OER project, which we didn't cover yet. Um, but um, yeah, it's one um, perspective to add here. So let's see what the next steps uh, bring. Um, what could you, yeah, we covered that. Thank you. Let's move to the next slide. Um, yeah, let's see what possible next steps are out there for you. And I will give the uh, word to Mira again. Yes, uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, yes, exciting. <laughs> so we're here right now. Um, you've already indicated in your answers in the, que in the questionnaire where your institution is at. And uh, as Claudia has announced, um, still many of us are either at a pilot um, step or a pilot level or uh, starting to develop a service. And of course, it's not a black and white um, kind of division. You can be with one foot in one level, another foot in another level. Uh, it's quite fluid. It's changing. It's going back and forth. You're shifting gears uh, back and forth. That's all understandable. Um, if we go to the next slide. Yes, um, we would like to ask you, where are you now and where are you heading? So we would like to, of course, you see this uh, three levels already indicated here, but if you'd like to take um, a better look at what they are about, at what kind of stakeholders you can be uh, approaching at each of the levels, um, then uh, if Paula could please uh, put the link into the chat, uh, you could have a few minutes to go to the infographics, as I've mentioned, developed by our partners at SURF, it's in English, and take a look at each of these three levels uh, in detail, just take one of two minutes, and uh, please, when you come back from this a little exercise, um, since we're here uh, in a quite a small group, I think it would be very appropriate if you could just open your mic and um, just, uh, yeah, say it out loud. Where are you at and where do you think you're heading uh, and when are you getting there, according to your estimates? So let's take just one or two minutes and explore it. When I'm looking at your answers that you gave at the beginning of the, um, of the session today, we have a few uh, answering with uh, level one exploration through a pilot, um, but um, yeah, maybe now that you've heard more about it, um, you want to um, change your answer or uh, have different thoughts. So please feel free to share um, also in the chat or um, jump in with your microphone. Um, yeah. Yes, really curious to hear your observations and reflections. Please uh, share with us. Because there's always more nuance than just uh, level one, level two, well, level three. We know that the full story is way more interesting uh, than just sticking one box. 
Maybe I can start as an icebreaker Thank you. Yes, <laughs> uh, thanks, with Paola. my other with my other head uh, of a project manager at Politecnico di Milano, where we started developing our first uh, uh, pilot with uh, open educational resources in 2016, a while ago, uh, and the, the small garden where we could start with something practical was uh, uh, our MOOC platform in the learning, um, because we, we control it somehow into the learning innovation unit. So we could uh, release one of the MOOCs that we internally produced with, an, with open licenses. And that's where we started exploring. I think that I, uh, when I answered the Google form that you shared with us, and thank you for that, um, somehow I think that I, uh, I answered exploration through a pilot. Because I can't say, as you were saying, uh, nuances, uh, shades of gray here, uh, we can say that we actually succeeded in developing a service, but in, a, in another way, if I look at it, through that first MOOC, what happened is that uh, somehow talking about licenses became part of the norm. So from that moment on, we started discussing about licensing uh, open, with uh, an open license MOOC content with the content experts. So it was easy somehow to start discussing just as an opportunity, you know. And what happened uh, since then is that uh, now releasing content openly in the MOOC platform, at least, is, uh, is the norm, not the other way around. Uh, so we still have challenges. We don't have a policy in our institution. We don't have a national policy. Uh, so we are continuing in between this exploration through new pilots. Every time is a new pilot to see if it is more convincing Let's see if we have some new stakeholders on board or if we have a champion and uh, someone that is willing to recognize the efforts between teachers, you know. Um, and at the same time, with all these uh, shades of gray, we are somehow also developing a service at the same time. So uh, still nothing official. Uh, let's see. I can't say that we can uh, look at level three um, with any kind of um, timeline in mind, okay? But that's where we are headed anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. Nice reflection, good reflection indeed. A very relatable, I think, to most of us, to probably to all of us. And here, Jana also shared uh, in the comments that she uh, thinks uh, that relationship building is indeed important and uh, more focus should be um, paid to that and I, Fully agree, fully, fully agree. That goes without saying, as the open should be the norm, <laughs> relationship building should go hand in hand with that as well. I can't actually say that we are on level one because we're not developing a pilot, but we're not at zero either. So, the, you know, there's that in between space where you have individuals who are creating OER within your institution you have people who are interested in getting involved with policy development and all of that, but there's still not enough kind of backing and, and support either nationally or from within the university to actually give you that push and, and make that happen. So, but I do believe that relationship building at that point then is key also. Because it's, it's then when you're going to find who your champions could be. and But then the other thing is, I was in awe of, of both of you, Mira and Claudia, when you said that you have uh, certifications, that there, that there is a way of recognizing educators who are involved in, in creating OER and institutions that are involved in doing that, because I think that's key. And until you have some form of recognition of that work, at least in our institution, teaching staff are so busy that something that is not going to end up bringing them any kind of recognition will probably not get done unless they are, you know, super, super passionate about it. And you have some of those, 
but they're not the norm. Indeed, yeah. Enthusiasm uh, takes you a long way, but only so far. Indeed, if it's not in any way properly rewarded and recognized, and it's not working for the educator's CV, professional development, there's only so much you can do. Indeed, that's also what we faced um, having started with working with early adopters. Those are usually the enthusiastic people, the ones who don't at least at the beginning, who don't need extra uh, reward or recognition, but most people do. We also do as professionals supporting uh, open education at our institutions or national levels. So that's a very normal and um, appropriate need to have, I would say. And it's still something we should focus, my institution, uh, University of Groningen, should focus more on. And this is for the next three years, this is our biggest priority indeed to incentivize, to properly incentivize. We're already doing it in some smaller ways, but even, you know, giving proper visibility to teachers uh, engaging in this educational practice um, to showcase their excellence, educational excellence might be an issue. It's so easy to, to showcase your research excellence, at least uh, in the sector of higher education we work in, right? The whole system revolves around that. You publish, you get uh, huge uh, grants, um, European level or uh, at the national level. But educational excellence is usually, um, you know, the, the the younger sibling of the research excellence. So this all goes hand in hand. And some things are maybe some challenges are quite big for the open education people to tackle um, alone on their own. So that's why we also need to find those connections, build those relationships, recognize the common struggles and common needs um, others have here in this system. Yeah, we had the need for this uh, national certification body uh, that followed up uh, with the following up project. So as I told you, we started with the Open Education Austria, where we just explored a bit, had some prototype of the meta search engine. But now with this follow up project uh, started uh, in 2020, um, they really established that um, certification body. And um, uh, yeah, so it's up and running now. Um, and a few universities have already um, certified themselves as an OER higher education institution, which is not that easy because you need an OER repository, you need an OER policy, an OER uh, qualification training offer, uh, and you need a several amount of um, uh, university staff, uh, so several amount of people that have certified as an OER practitioner. So it's um, quite a journey to reach this. Uh, they have an international uh, gremium that um, provides these uh, certifications. And yeah, we're, we're aiming for this uh, with University of Vienna, um, but um, since the uh, number of people that have to be an OER practitioner um, uh, scales up if the university is bigger and uh, University of Vienna is the biggest in Austria, it's quite a large, large number to reach. Um, but uh, as you see, Marta, we also have um, lots of different services also uh, my colleague Jana from uh, University of Vienna said we have lots of infrastructure, um, but we, of course, uh, yeah, have a few things to work on. For example, the, the policy, the framework coming from top to bottom, but also the relationship building. Um, now that we can use all this infrastructure being in place for many, many years, um, for example, uh, the repository has been up and running more than um, 15 years um, and it works perfectly. But um, yeah, we uh, now um, are yeah on the way to, um, to fill it. There are lots of you know, um, OER in there already, um, but um, yeah, we want to um, gain uh, insight into the faculties. For example, Mira, your examples with the faculty visits and the faculty um, trainings meetings um, is something um, that we also considered. Uh, we'll have to see how how uh, it's possible for us uh, to sneak in there um, and um, yeah how to who who to ask uh, in the strategic hierarchy of um, the university um, uh, but this will be an um, uh, interesting journey um, so let's see um, yeah where we where we'll be at in in a few months or maybe in in a year yeah um, anybody else want to share um, their experiences. Um, we also have some possible next steps for you uh, ready in, in another slide. Maybe this will also be interesting for you, um, just to keep in mind uh, different uh, tools um, and links for you. For example, these uh, three levels, um, uh, the document Mira shared already, 
uh, but also the Knowledge Bank. And yeah, on all things OER related uh, from the Netherlands um, that Mira mentioned um, for um, currently in, in German language, um, we have the uh, knowledge base for setting up and running an OER repository. We have several MOOCs on OER collected for you. Um, um, so you can check that out. Uh, and also coming from our um, um, project in Austria, we have these, uh, this meta workflow for the OER production service at uh, your institution if you want to start and have a look at how to set up a media, uh, media production service, for example, uh, just as a few links. And um, you can have a look at it uh, afterwards as well. In the chat, I will quickly provide the links for you uh, if you want to check them out. Let's see. And um, yeah, we also <laughs> brought some um, more um, uh, questions for you, maybe to consider when you want to start and um, um, take a few next steps. So if you uh, jump a few slides down, um, we have a few questions for you in there um, when you want to set up and start your institutional pilot project uh, on OER. Yeah, on the next one. Thank you. So if you want to start and um, take first steps, next steps in uh, OER at your institution, we um, maybe start with, yeah, what is your experience of starting? Um, uh, what experience have you collected if you already started? And yes, you see, we, we have uh, quite a few uh, different experiences shared with you now. Also challenges. Um, maybe if you want to start um, share in, in the last minutes of our um, uh, afternoon together, what challenges did you face already? What has worked best for you? Um, or yeah, which perspectives um, do you see in there? Feel free to share since we're uh, nearly at the end of our session together. Um, it would be wonderful if you want to share a few last thoughts with us. Or any, um, Marta, Mira, do you have any uh, challenges that you faced um, that you want to share in in these last minutes? Oh, so many. <laughs> so many. It's still no, no. going on with them. <laughs> I was just to, I was just about to say the same, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, uh, thanks to all your experiences. What I see is that uh, you are at different stages, you are sharing uh, different uh, uh, levels of development, and I'm sure that there are challenges behind the scenes uh, on top of what you shared. Uh, that's the same we have in the experience that we are building uh, in, in the university I'm working at, and also in the NOL, that's what we hear from many practitioners. Um, but one of the things, first of all, you said two things. One came from Mira, and you said at a certain point that uh, you don't put the spotlight on what you do. Sometimes I think this is a good strategy to wait, to give visibility to some of the ongoing uh, uh, attempts or experiences till the moment comes when someone might be asking for them. That would be ideal. And then another thing that I was thinking in relation to what you said about uh, uh, being more uh, attentive to pe the people involved, I strongly believe on that. Uh, in, in, in my small experience, the things that work the best are the ones that we were able to develop talking with uh, people. And it, I don't mean only key people with uh, uh, decision-making head on their, on their head. Sometimes it might be practitioners, sometimes it might be technical staff who are interested in exploring something new for them. Why not? And in the nuances of open education, we discovered in, in our experience at Polimi that there are uh, opportunities to learn through open practices what you couldn't learn through, let's say, uh, other approaches. So this was really interesting for us, at least. So uh, together with the challenges, I would 
I would say that it's a discovery process that is no different from any other research experience. So why not? <laughs> and Paola, I, I would add, even though we are not an open education institution in UCD, one of the things that has worked amazingly well is a partnership with students. Um, the resources that we are creating are mostly co-created with mm -hmm. students. Now, as I say, we, we make them as open as we can, but the process of working with students, creating content, working with students who have different um, learning styles, different um, learning needs, and who are aware of accessibility issues that they need to address has been absolutely amazing. Um, and it's made our resources much more accessible, much easier for learners to navigate and, and also much more open. So I think that perspective of the learner, of the student, and not just as somebody who passively looks at what you're doing, but who is co-creating with you, I think that is invaluable. Yeah, here, here, Marta, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> From our side, um, I wanted to share that, uh, well, maybe it, it will be the cheesy make uh, lemonade out of lemons uh, metaphor, but sometimes, sometimes it's as easy as that. Some challenges are actually big opportunities for you, uh, for your target audience, for uh, everyone you're working with. I had to think of this instance. I was um, talking to a colleague from another Dutch university, and I was quite jealous of them already having the OER policy. And we don't. We're doing this and that, but we don't have a, a central policy. And then this colleague uh, tells me, uh, sure, but when sometimes uh, at some stage of your development uh, of the service at the university, you come to the teachers with the centrally mandated policy and tell them, hey, we have this top down kind of <laughs> policy that mandates you to do this and that. And uh, you start feeling more resistance than when you come to them uh, with a more or less kind of pilot, experimental, entrepreneurial mindset, let's see what we can do together and so on, without any kind of centrally mandated um, air <laughs> coming with you. Um, and that works. That also works sometimes, maybe not at every stage of the university uh, service development, but that worked in our case and that will work in any pilot stage, I think. So it doesn't always have to be an obstacle. It can also be an advantage. Um, I think many challenges can be looked at like this. Um, but of course, um, you know, as we've mentioned, uh, and as uh, I think Jana mentioned in the comments as well, small steps, um, keeping your breath, long, uh, as they say in, in Dutch, having a long breath and, uh, well, being patient, uh, not getting too frustrated, that uh, goes a long way. So this time. is the last workshop that we have in our calendar before the summer break. And uh, after the summer in September, uh, we will uh, start our uh, academic year, let's say, with a new workshop where we will all be available. All our facilitators in the European Network of Open Education Librarians will be available for you if you are interested to ask us anything. Uh, so go back to our recordings, collect your questions, focus on what you can do uh, in your context. Small step tactics always work, and even big steps if you are in a position where you can take them and come and ask us. It might be that we don't have uh, specific answers, but it might be that discussing uh, your challenges uh, in this context could be helpful to make the next step more effective. So let's try that. And it's going to be the 26th of September from 1 to 2.30 in uh, Central European summertime still. Uh, and then we will have another workshop uh, in autumn. We still have to decide uh, the specific date, but we will let you know through social media. Um, because we would like to build on the experience that we did in this first uh, half, one and a half year of this uh, Embrace the Open series and share with you also about uh, the experience itself of creating a process where 
librarians across Europe who never worked together before, sometimes who speak different languages and are, as you can see, at different stage of development in their open education experiences, can join their strength and share knowledge with the, the, the audience. And we are very happy to share all the tools that we use to make this happen. So thanks again to Marta, Mira and Claudia for your uh, wonderful work today. And uh, I'm happy to thank all the participants and all the people that are going to watch this recording in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Goodbye.